Greetings, everyone. Now, it's 40 minutes past 12, and we're going to start the second, second part for the FinTech conference here. My name is Emils, and I am a payment and financial market uh, analyst at the Bank of Latvia, and I'm going to be your host today. So, the day is split, the rest of the day is split in two parts. You're going to have three keynotes now, and then we're going to have a small break, and then we're going to have the rest of four keynotes. So the structure will be quite simple. We have a keynote, and then we have a short Q&A session if there is a time left. So as I know, a lot of you are here to listen to the keynotes and not the moderator. So I'm gonna be try I, I, I will try to be quite short. And now I would like to welcome on the stage Marcus Lambert, the co-founder and CEO of Montonio, with a keynote, how open platforms are disrupting the FinTech. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I hope you've had a great conference so far. And uh, just as a quick teaser on uh, what I'm going to be discussing on, on stage today, uh, basically what I'm seeing on the financial markets is that there is massive change in the kind of uh, way in which solutions are both architected as well as delivered to customers. And the kind of one underlying part I'm seeing a lot of is uh, basically disruption in the supply chain and as well as in the in the customer end. So yeah, just really quickly uh, as an intro, I will be talking about how open financial models cultivate both efficiency for uh, consumers as well as efficiency for, for service providers. And then also a really kind of uh, quick overview on uh, what the future might look like. Uh, but yeah, to get started really quickly about me, let's uh, let's try to get to know each other. Uh, so, yes, I'm Marcus. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Montonio Finance. Um, m my background actually lies in building uh, solutions for, for e-commerce stores. Then, uh, while working at a service provider, kind of realized that what I was building was pretty useless. So, based on this, quit my job. We raised a bit of incubation capital, started Montonio. And now, within the past 10 years, we've built a payment uh, institution which has grown from around 40 to 1,800 merchants across the Baltics. And yeah, one of the things I, I ponder about in, in my free time is exactly the, the fact on how financial services will be distributed in the future. Uh, but yeah, really quickly, let's, let's take a look at what the status quo has currently been. So yeah, when, when you look at the, the way in which financial services are basically gotten from, from the kind of initiation side, the acquiring side, and then all the way to the consumer, then we can see that it is based on a lot of proprietary networks and kind of legacy systems being built around those. So one of them, I'm, I'm sure you all know, it's, it's card networks, it's acquiring schemes, which is basically a duopoly on the market, uh, largely run by Visa and, and MasterCard. So, I mean, if, if you think about it from a market structure perspective, then by having a duopole within one of the most needed services in, in finance, then that is bound to have inefficiencies, that is bound to have a transaction cost, which on average globally is over 2%, which also makes, uh, let's say, consuming and spending more expensive for consumers. And now, if you look at the other kind of uh, more, more Baltic services, then one of the things I'm sure all of you are familiar with is BankLink services. So as a bit of history as well on, on how that came to be, it's basically that 10, 20 years ago, the banks got together. They decided that they want to have a 1% margin of all e-commerce flowing through those markets. So based on this, again, let's build proprietary APIs. Let's get a few organizations to distribute them. We will have absolute control over pricing. Again, e-commerce is really hit with a 2% extra tax. And we can kind of start looking even further than, let's say, only e-commerce and payments. We can look at, for example, insurance models. So in, in insurance, again, we are going through quite a change within the past, let's say, even five years where insurance used to be a, pro a product which is underwritten, risk is taken, and it is, is, it is distributed by one single organization. And now we have open insurance markets, open insurance models, which promote higher coverage and at the same time, lesser costs. 
And yeah, when we get even more abstract than this, and this is one of the areas in which I'm not seeing a lot of activity right now, but it's investment services. So in, in investments, there are two really important aspects which are currently controlled rather uh, with the monopoly. So it's access to high quality information and it is liquidity. So everything else, so I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, let's say, Robinhood or uh, just an Estonian company, Lightyear, launched, which is kind of the Robinhood uh, alternative for Europe. And this is all kind of the UI of the solution. On the back end, nevertheless, the information, the, the payment for order flow, the kind of liquidity is provided by centralized uh, uh, old school companies. But all right, let's, let's have a look at uh, how that, that, say, that change has basically progressed. So if, if you think about a bank as a service provider, then the kind of old school model would be, you're going to, uh, uh, let's say the bank office, you, you're doing your transaction, let's say you're getting a loan. Uh, the, next, uh, the next kind of step of this is really that you, you take the old school service, which was you going to the bank, now you make it virtual. You, you open a uh, online uh, banking service. All right, so here we are, but it's still a closed service. Now, what do I mean by it being an open platform? So let's take a look at, let's say, loans. Uh, when it comes to loans, the, the single most expensive things are distribution and risk. Uh, money itself is pretty cheap when you're a bank. And when it comes to distribution, that can amount to up to 30% of the actual cost of the loan taken up by the consumer. Now, in, in, the kind of, in this graph, we would be looking at, let's say this is a closed service. It's, it's a single bank offering their service. They are doing the marketing. They are uh, taking on the risk. They are basically going end to end with the entire product. And now if we kind of reimagine this in an open platform sense, then you're able to come to a uh, platform which has multiple different lenders, which is taking care of the distribution. Uh, now where the efficiency comes in with this is really that you are firstly uh, really focused as a distribution agent. And when it comes to the lenders themselves, then they have access to a wide variety of customers of different channels. And the efficiency within, let's say, the lending uh, process in general if you have, let's say, a one singular application, which, let's say, has five different credit models behind it, five different creditors, what will happen is that the consumer will have much more choice. At the same time, it will be a competitive offering, bringing down APR rates. And in addition, it will be heightened in the approval rates aspect as well, because by having multiple different creditors looking at it from multiple different credit models and multiple different kind of views on the data, we're able to achieve a much higher absolute kind of maximum efficiency. But yeah, currently on the market, we're really seeing that the next generation services are built exactly on the kind of two fronts, either closed virtual services or open platforms. And my personal hypothesis being that within the next even three to four years, it will be moving much, much faster towards open platforms and that not only in the sense of loans, it has already gone through largely within insurance. I also see that this will affect investment services and uh, also underwriting of various different, different products. And yeah, now a few examples as well on, on what it actually means that you, you have an open network and how it leads to efficiency. So I'm sure most of you have already heard about the mystical animal open banking. And this is really from, from the European Commission coming from two kinds of angles. Firstly, this to kind of create a unified platform of payments across the European Union. And secondly, also to offer access to free flowing information and transactions to both consumers as well as institutions. So as a bit of background then, uh, really, really simplifying this, open banking allows two things to be done really, really efficiently. Either you can be a, a uh, payment institution offering payment initiation services, which means that you can, uh, on behalf of the customer, initiate payments uh, for money to be moved from one account to another account. So this is actually the way in which we at Montonio are offering our kind of BankLink 2.0 services. And the second part, which is also really exciting about open banking, is that it also propagates the, the flow of information and really empowers customers and consumers to take advantage of this information. 
So again, let's let's look at lending. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm going back to lending uh, quite quite often, but it is a super interesting product. And in lending, currently, again, when we think about the curve, it is mainly on on kind of closed virtual services, and the access to information is largely twofold. Either lenders rely on uh, what I call secondary information, which is basically they look at your zip code, they look at your phone number, your income, then they have, let's say, okay, this zip code correlates to a, uh, I don't know, 5% increase in the probability that you will be uh, uh, paying back your loan. But when you think about, in essence, they are not looking holistically at you as a consumer. So basically, what open banking has allowed is for you to take your banking information, um, your, your transaction information, share it with the lender extremely easily, so uh, you can have a much more holistic view from the lender towards you. And it is, again, fully automatic based on electronic identification. And uh, yeah, example number two, one of the things we, we already discussed is the insurance networks where distribution is handled by, by specific platforms, which are then working with, let's say, five different uh, insurance providers. This will result in, one, better coverage for, for consumers, and uh, secondarily, also better cost structures behind this, because, I mean, it's, it's logical, it is a competitive marketplace for, for insurance. And now, I, I'd say one of the more interesting examples is if, if you take the market of, uh, let's say, FX uh, currency conversion, then uh, if, if you look at, again, the, the kind of old school market, it used to be a, a kind of wide variety of uh, property bank services, uh, correspondent banks, and uh, moving money back and forth, and basically charging not only 2%, not only 3%, but up to 5% for those transactions. And turns out that building a open model uh, based on multiple currency pools is the most efficient way to go about the market. So this, again, huge, huge props to, uh, to WISE for, for figuring this out, and they've really shown that platforms at scale are able to cultivate a lot of efficiency, both in terms of transaction speeds uh, and the kind of transaction costs. Whew, yeah, so this is kind of an illustration on, on how the next levels of, of lending will look like. So we start out with, again, lending offices. Then currently we are in a stage where we have secondary data, appraised on credit models, and kind of moving into the fully automatic online credit distribution. And then the, the third stage, the, the kind of fourth stage here, really is in connection to automatic data access, as well as the, the ability to use this in an open platform sense. So, okay, now I've, I've told you about how, in, in my opinion, uh, financial services will be distributed in the future uh, through open models, basically, where you have a lot of uh, kind of uh, back-end work being done by, by the kind of liquidity providers, the loan providers. And now this, this really kind of raises the question, okay, if, if the c customers are, let's say, using open platforms for getting their loans, so what is the role of, of the kind of traditional bank in the future? And I'd say that there are kind of quite a few aspects in, in which they can move forward. Um, and it is really kind of trying to figure out how you can be uh, well connected within those uh, op open platforms. And again, another difficulty is that none of those open platforms will have the, the liquidity and the infrastructure when it comes to, for example, SEPA infrastructure, which is actually really, really difficult unless you are a bank. So here comes in the major opportunity for banks, which is actually really focusing on building up this infrastructure and the quality of the infrastructure so they will be able to actually offer it to, uh, to outside platforms and, uh, and really tap into the value being created by those platforms. Now, when it comes to investment services, again, uh, then, then the interesting part there is that a lot of kind of uh, consumer investment services, so thinking about, let's say, the likes of Robinhood, they are tied to, uh, to large market makers who, who actually take up the order, who pay Robinhood the fee to, to be on, on the privilege of actually processing your order. And uh, here comes in the kind of conflict of interest again. It is, again, a kind of uh, uh, monopoly of, of services who are able to do this. And now, if, if you think about why would they be willing to pay Robinhood for, uh, for, for, for the privilege to, uh, to really process your transaction. It is purely about information. They're able to take this information, uh, front run orders, uh, and uh, really create a lot of value out of it your, uh, for, for themselves. 
But yeah, on the kind of infrastructure side, we are seeing a lot of activity actually from the banks. So one of my favorite examples here is actually LHV Bank. So LHV has taken a really proactive stance when it comes to, uh, to fintech and innovation. So if you look at LSV, LSV offering, then they have really two parts to this. They've created this separate UK banking branch, which is purely focused on, uh, on aiding fintech and innovation. And they're the kind of infrastructure provider for a lot of fintech activity going on around the market. And for example, one of the things I, I, I really like about them is that they have taken it this step further. They've crea basically created abstraction layers on top of the kind of complexity of, let's say, SEPA and IBAN transactions. They've created what they call LHV Connect, which is super powerful for a platform or a fintech to use. And I think in the long term, this will uh, really be the, the power of LHV as a brand and as a technology provider. Uh, into, let's say, the next uh, 10, 15, 20, 20 years. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I think about the market. And uh, now a bit more specific on, on uh, <laughs> what the hell I'm actually building. Uh, so yeah, at Montonio, we are really tapping into, into open networks. And we, we are able to do it in a way where we create a wide value uh, through our orchestration platform for e-commerce and kind of Abstracting it a bit less, what it means is we've created a orchestration network of, of different payment options, of, of different banks, of, of different services, and we're able to offer this at, at costs which are uh, 10, 20 times less than the kind of old school proprietary API based providers. And at the same time, we're able to, uh, to utilize those networks for, for additional value creation. And uh, yeah. This is kind of the, the quick overview on, uh, on, on what, what we've built, what, uh, what Montonio is, and, uh, and me, myself. So I hope it was interesting. Okay, thank you, Marcus. But uh, as I see, we have a time for a lot of questions. Yeah. So are there any questions from the audience for the Marcus? Anyone? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go. Mike? Uh, about lending again, back to... <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'm not big banker, but as I understand, the lending is big business of banks. Why would they give up that business? Yeah, so, so that's actually a really interesting kind of situation because they, they don't want to give up that business. They don't want to give up their kind of proprietary distribution channels and that kind of the right relationship. But here comes in the kind of uh, market of the consumer rather of the service provider. So as a consumer, it is critical for you to have a lot of choice and to really go for the best offers which, which are provided on the market. And that is true in, in, in any kind of financial context. So, I mean, we, are, we have seen it play out in, in, in insurance and it is really, really evident that the efficiency is there. And it's just about those platforms getting really good at distribution. And then once the kind of uh, customer goes through that flow, let's say once, then it is really a, a strong hook in the sense that they do see, uh, for example, in, in the case of Montonio, our lending product is, is built in a way that we, we have a single loan application, and after this, within seven seconds, we show the customer five different credit offers, and we see that this builds a lot of trust with the customer, and then the next time, they won't even be going direct to the lender because they can see the whole overview of the market through a, the, through a singular point of contact. So in that sense, I think it's, it's just kind of the, the shift in, in the customer mentality, which will ultimately be taking down the banks, so they won't be wanting to, to do that themselves, for sure. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? Okay, then there is time for my question. So, how do you see how we can improve more the open banking? Because, as I have heard, there are many restrictions, and there are no standardization, for example, for such a simple things as the fields which should be returned when the API request is made. So, in, what in your opinion, what we could change and what should be changed? Yeah, you know, that, that is a really, really difficult uh, question. And I'd say the weight of, of the lack of standardization and information flow really weighs on service providers such as uh, Montonio, not so much on the banks who, who frankly don't give a shit. 
So when it comes to, to the market in general, then there are kind of two, two things I'm seeing pretty aggressively. Either it's data uh, abstraction layers, meaning that, uh, for example, providers such as Japli who take the, the kind of uh, API infrastructure, they build it into a single use API, kind of fixing the issues with the, with the data within there. But what I'm seeing on the market currently is that this has really subpar quality when it comes to those connections. So those providers are really optimizing towards rather uh, being able to say we have 5,000 banks than let's say being able to say we have 50 banks which work really, really well. So there on a kind of European scale, we are seeing uh, conversions as low as let's say 70, 80%. And uh, that means failed transaction levels of around 20%. So then it is kind of, uh, service providers like Montonio, who go really, really in depth into the API connections, are able to achieve uh, conversion rates of 94, 95, 96 percent. But that is a lot of work, and it gets even more interesting when you take it from, let's say, not only a local standpoint, but you look outwards into the entirety of the European Union, where there are even more different API standards. So, uh, but yeah, there there is no easy way about it. You need to do the hard work and kind of making it all work together through further abstraction layers or through really, really in-depth integrations with those different standards. It is a lot of work right now, but uh, I, I think it can only get better from, uh, from here on, let's say within the next five years. Okay, thank you. So maybe, okay, yes, gentleman in the white. There's the mic. Yeah. Uh, could you expand a little bit on uh, your service offering? Like, do you offer anything specific to fintechs? Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, sure thing. So we are a service provider for e-commerce businesses. And what we, we offer e-commerce is, well, basically the entirety of, of different payment options. So it's really, we've built it in two ways. So firstly, we've created a payment orchestration network into which we've kind of plugged in uh, I'd say most of, of different European payment providers. So it's, it's a single integration for, uh, for the merchant. They get access to a wide variety of value. Secondarily also in the kind of context of bank links, we've created our own uh, payment initiation offering built upon uh, efficiency and open banking. So here the main difference with Montonia is that we actually have solved the conversion issue. Our conversions are 94, 95, 96%. And the third part into which we are getting more and more aggressively is the lending part. So there again, we've built it in a way where we have a open platform. So it means that within the context of e-commerce and checkout, the customer selects, they want to uh, buy now, pay later, or get a, a higher purchase financing for the, for the, for the offer. And that then what happens is we firstly collect information from population registries, we authenticate the customer, then we uh, send over that information via API to, to, to a large number of different lenders who then come back to, uh, to us with different financing offers which we then, then display to, to the customer themselves. So, it, and we are working on quite a few different aspects here, but the underlying kind of uh, aspect of this is, is bringing uh, efficiency towards checkout and at the same time simplifying it to the way that it is only one service provider, it is a singular API integration and then you're able to tap into any kind of payment related network uh, across Europe. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Okay, then again, give you another mine. So, are the banks open working with fintechs? Because usually the API integrations and open, open banking integrations uh, take a lot of work. And as I have heard that uh, banks are not willing to work with the fintechs because they are saying that they're going to take a part away from them, like a business part or business use cases and stuff like that. So in your experience, how is working with the banks? Yes and no. So if, if you get started, then uh, banking relations is one of the most difficult aspects which, which you can go for. So I mean, of course, you come onto the market, you offer something super innovative, which will take market share from, uh, from let's say, banks. They, they, they don't kind of openly greet you onto the market, say, all right, here, take our market share, let's go. It is rather a, a process of you building incremental value to, uh, to merchants, to customers. And at that point, when, for example, with Montonio, we've gone from uh, working with 40 merchants uh, end of last year, now it's close to 2,000. Then when, when that growth curve starts happening, then the, the, the kind of financial service providers and lenders start looking at it, 
oh shit, okay, now the market is going to get away from us, so how can we cooperate now? So it's rather a kind of uh, last minute kind of grasp for, for staying on the market. So it is, it is a difficult market dynamic, as in it can be cannibalizing, but it can also be really, really fruitful uh, cooperation. It depends just on the kind of market context. But yeah, I'd say the, when it comes to the, the specifics of, of fintech, then uh, really starting out uh, with, with those lenders or financial supervisors can be difficult, but it, uh, it gets better the more you grow and the more you show that you are actually a threat to them, then they want to be your best friend. Okay, anyone now? Is there someone who wants to ask a question regarding the open banking to the Marcus? Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you for a good presentation. I have a question uh, regarding, you said your conversion rate is about 94, 96%, but uh, what is the coverage of uh, banks in Europe Yes, so currently we are operating within uh, within the Baltics, and we are currently adding on Poland as well. So that's that's the coverage we're focusing on right now. And yeah, of course, within the next two years, we want to be uh, with pan-European uh, coverage. So that's what we're working on actively. Okay, but uh, from your side, what there is... There was a second oh. question. There is a follow-up? Yep, okay. And when you will expand with the bank's coverage, how do you think your conversion rate will drop or not? So yeah, with, with each kind of new standard being picked up, that's, that's again the question. But we, okay, now I'm getting a bit more in depth, but the way in which we've built our payment initiation solution is that we've created a separate payment control engine, which is really the underlying logic on how transactions are, are processed. So in that sense, we are relying less on the kind of quality of the APIs of, of the banks. So any API is able to just fire transactions. It's just that when providers rely on them too much, then you can have bad conversions. We, we've kind of taken the weight off of these APIs, built it into our internal service, which is really controlling any, any transaction for any specific transaction it is, looking at, okay, should this transaction be an instant payment or okay, if it is a cross-border payment, then instant might be uh, an issue, so let's do it as a kind of standard SEPA payment. So this is actually a core part of the work we do at Montonio, and this is kind of the, the underlying aspect on how our conversions can be, let's say, 10, 20% higher than, let's say, other market participants. And uh, yeah, this is really kind of core technical work. Okay, following up on this, what is the main problem why Montonio hasn't spread to the Europe now, like pan across the Europe? Yeah, so I mean, it, it starts out, of course, with with you take it, taking your first market, then your second market, then you take your third market. Uh, but yeah, we see that our, our kind of growth is also accelerating. So by, by getting the kind of initial uh, <laughs> zero to 2,000 merchants, we've really built a lot of the core of the solution. So for example, one of the things we built really, really recently is that at first, the merchant onboarding was manual. It was contracts back and forth. Then we create an account for them in the solution. So now it's fully automatic. Anyone can come to our web page, sign up, and start using Monterno right away. And this is kind of, if you think about it, this is laying the foundation for innate scalability within the platform. So for the next markets, we will be able to move so much more faster, and then at the same time also start taking markets in parallel. So in other words, year one, we, we take four markets. By, by year two, we take, let's say, 10, 15. By three, year three, we're pan-European. So it's really kind of building the foundation and then utilizing this foundation for hyperscaling. Okay, but what about the competition? Yeah, like co yeah, competition is, is super interesting on the market because, I mean, if, if you look at open banking, this is really taking down the, the barrier to entry. And what we're seeing is, is really two types of, of competitors. So one of them are the API layers about which I was uh, speaking earlier. So those are, let's say, the Yapilis of the world. Uh, they, they really focus on, on having as wide of a coverage as possible. Uh, the reason why we don't work with those providers is that the conversions are really, really bad. So when I'm speaking about conversions of, let's say, the high 90%, then by utilizing an aggregator, it would be a miracle if you get over 80%. So this is really the coverage versus quality aspect. The second part we're seeing is kind of uh, providers who are purely building within payments layers. So here we have also a few uh, Baltic companies who are building purely on top of open banking and uh, purely on the uh, on the kind of payment initiation side. 
And here we can really see two issues with that market. So firstly, again, currently we do have the best technically uh, advanced solution on the market, so a lot of those providers are coming to us. And secondarily, if you are only a payment layer for a merchant, then you have really low innate defensibility versus if in Montonio's case, we have a wide variety of value offering and we can basically guarantee the merchant that with our payment, uh, payment orchestration network, you will always have the best terms, you will always have the best coverage of payment methods on any market you go to. So it's, it's really kind of difficult um, or rather different aspect into which we are moving on the market. So we don't want to just be a payment layer, we want to be a holistic checkout provider. Okay, you touched just an interesting topic of mine, which is payments. So basically, as we know, that uh, the open banking payments are made through instant payments. Am I right? So it depends. So again, I, I briefly touched upon this. Uh, with instant payments, when it comes to cross-border, there might be issues with this. So there we were opting for doing standard SEPA transaction as well. So this is what our uh, kind of company uh, brain is, is handling out. And uh, yeah, so instant payments are a, a big aspect of it, but it can also be kind of a standard set of payments. So it doesn't really uh, kind of tie you to only one. But what, you, what do you do in the case if the payment takes more hours? What do you show to the merchant? For example, the payment is made, mm -hmm. but what is the status of the payment? Yeah, so we, we have basically a few statuses through which the, the payment is moving. So firstly, it is in the kind of authenticated side, and then it moves into once we get the final confirmation, we, we move it over to, uh, uh, to submit it and, and done, even though the money on the back end through the kind of next HEPA cycle might take a bit longer to get there. But for the merchant, it is basically an instantaneous process of, of you being certain that you will be getting the money. And uh, yeah, so, so it is really straightforward for them. Uh, in the back end, the complexity is being taken care of by us, so the money might not arrive right away, but we already give you the kind of green light and we kind of take responsibility for this. Okay, is there any question from the audience now? Okay, then I'm gonna give it Marcus the last question and then gonna go let him go. <laughs> so, the question is, in what, in your opinion, how we should improve the open banking to it be more efficient, better, and safer. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm sure you know a lot about uh, central banking and the kind of role it pay, plays in here. I think the kind of uh, regulator has a lot to, to move on here. So when it comes to the specific uh, banks offering those services, the, the quality and the standardization is just not there. So uh, one of the things you, you mentioned is the standardization of, of APIs and data. Uh, the, the next level would, would basically be getting in depth with the, with the licensing processes of, of those providers as well. So in some cases, uh, the, the kind of risk profile being applied by the regulator to the service provider, it's not the actual risk level on which the service provider is operating. So there is a bit of dissonance there as well. But yeah, from a core level, it is really data standardization and really being kind of firm with the banks. So for example, one of the worst experiences of open banking has been with Luminor Bank. And uh, I, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't want to be mean here, but it's not only open banking, it's also their kind of full online presence, which has been really, really down, uh, down par compared to anything else on the market. So again, a, a more firm kind of regulatory aspect there would be really, really, really appreciated by, by the entirety of the market to make sure that those solutions actually work, that people can log into the bank, people can actually do transactions with their banking service provider. I mean, there's two options, either Lumidor will have no customers or the regulator will step in and, and kind of take care of that themselves. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Last chance, is there any question from the audience? Okay. I guess you partially already answered that question, but my precise is uh, regulators, are they helping or uh, yet sleeping or what's there? Yeah, that, that is a kind of uh, touchy topic in, in the sense that regulators are, are quite different. For example, we are working with the Estonian and Lithuanian regulators. Uh, when, when we will look at the work we're doing with the regulators, then they are willing to listen, but we're not seeing too much activity on, on their part. Uh, again, we, we can kind of look at it from, from different, different standpoints. So it is either licensing, uh, licensing related, and then uh, either the kind of workings of the transactional systems of the country, actually. So when it comes to the kind of workings of the solution, 
and and actually looking at whether everything is working, then we see that there are a lot more work can be done and they're not doing enough. When it comes to licensing, then I think at some points they are doing too much work. So it's rather a question of uh, of, of focus on, on the kind of workings of infrastructure or really going hardcore at the kind of regulation of it. So yeah, uh, again, when, when licensing uh, different companies, then to be more looked at it from a risk standpoint rather than only looking at the book. And uh, secondarily, when it, when it comes to infrastructure, then I know as a regulator, it can be difficult for you to go to a big bank and say your, syst your systems are bad, please fix them. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, more work needs to be done there, especially. Okay, thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Marcus for this extensive, extensive Q&A session. So, the next.